So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Bernison Wheeler, she, her pronouns, and I am the Education and Outreach Coordinator at Women's Advocates. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to you along with the PowerPoint slides later today. Uh, without further ado, I'm so excited to introduce Lauren and Mary from the Domestic Abuse Project, and they will be discussing domestic violence and trauma-informed play therapy interventions for youth. Hi everyone, it's so excited to be here. Um, we can start out with a little bit of an introduction. Um, so yeah, first of all, just want to say thank you to Brennison and to the whole Women's Advocates team for having us. I'm super excited to make this connection between our agencies and um, just to have this opportunity to talk more about the things that we're passionate about. Um, so yeah, I'm Mary. I, yeah, I am an early childhood therapist at Domestic Abuse Project, so I work mainly with children ages zero to six, and there is a helicopter going by my house very low, so I apologize if you can hear that. Um, but yeah, I really um, do a lot of work with younger kids, although I also do some group work with older kids and then do some um, work with parents as well, and I, I do see a couple of older kids um, for play therapy clients as well. Um, and I will pass it over to Lauren. Hi everybody, welcome. Um, I'm Lauren, she, her pronouns, um, and I supervise our youth services at DAP. Um, I also hold a small caseload of clients, including um, play therapy, early childhood, and do some group work too. Um, so happy that everyone's here today um, and excited to get started. And I should, I should also say too, I forgot to mention that I also use she, her pronouns. Um, yeah, so super, super excited to see so many people from so many different areas. Um, it's really fun just to read where everybody is coming from, um, what their kind of like, what their lens is, what you know, kind of thinking about how you all will be able to use these, uh, the topics that we're going to talk about, and just, yeah, really thankful that you're here. So if, if you haven't, if you're comfortable, keep on um, putting, uh, putting those in the chat. We'd love to see. Um, and in the meantime, we can get started. So Lauren, would you be able to go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, okay. All right, so let's talk about our objectives. First and foremost, we will learn about the effects of children witnessing domestic violence. Um, we, will also, we will then talk about the use of non-directive play therapy, specific, specifically child-centered play therapy, which is the model that we use at Domestic Abuse Project um, for, for trauma processing work with youth. And then we will, you all will learn some general skills for responding to trauma play from children um, and supporting parents in witnessing and processing their children's trauma play. Um, and I'm seeing too in the comments that um, Brennison had just put out we, that we, women's advocates will be offering certificates of attendance for this webinar and Brennison will send instructions on how to request those at the end of the webinar. Okay, um, so then what we also wanted to be really clear about is that this is not a training teaching you how to how to do play therapy. Um, this is going to teach you about how it works and why we use it. Um, and hopefully it will prepare you to to recommend play therapy if you work in an advocate or a counselor position. Um, or if you're a parent, it will teach you about why we use play therapy and the mechanics behind it. Um, <clears throat> want to remind folks that therapy should only occur with a trained clinician who has been trained. If it's in play, if they're doing play therapy, you know, you want them to have some training in play therapy. Um, and generally, clinicians should have at least a master's level of education and should have licensure through the state or should be working towards licensure and have a board approved supervisor who is supervising their work. Um, we also want to mention that there's a type of therapy called filial therapy that's similar to um, non-directive play therapy, but it is more, it, it is parent involved and it teaches the parent how to, 
um, how to conduct play sessions, how to have those same um, sort of, so how to provide the same supports and how to create the same structures that we'll talk about as being present in play therapy. Um, and that this training is not about that. This training is about the, um, it's about play therapy that's conducted with a clinician. Um, but if that, that's something that sounds interesting to you, we'd encourage you to you know, do some of your own research. But again, just wanted to make that differentiation. Um, and so then we'll we'll have our first uh, our first poll, and that question is: How familiar are you with non-directive play therapy? Um, it is an anonymous poll, so your name will not be attached to anything. Um, so we'll get. I'm gonna send out the poll. Perfect. Oh, and I've seen a question, what is the type of play that involves parents? So that is filial therapy. Um, it's the third bullet point here. Oh, I must have, oh no, it's just the right screen. We're good. All right, we'll take just a couple more seconds and then I'll close the poll. Sounds good. All right, the poll's gonna close and share the results here. Can everybody see that? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so it looks like um, 35% of folks are saying they don't have any prior knowledge or context about non-directive play therapy. Um, majority of folks, about 55%, are saying I have a little bit of knowledge of non-directive play therapy. Then 7% say they know a good amount, and 3% they say they have been trained in it or use it in their practice, which is wonderful. And I think earlier I might not, when I was chatting about what this training doesn't do too, I do want to mentioned that, you know, this is very much open for clinicians and folks who have been trained in play therapy as well. We very much welcome you to the space, you know, and hope that you'll be able to take some, take some good stuff away from it as well. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Yep. Okay, so we're going to start out by talking and just creating a definition of abuse. So abuse is a systematic pattern of behaviors in a relationship that are used to gain and or maintain power and control over another. Um, and what is, so what is domestic violence specifically? Um, so all of the following things constitute domestic violence if they're occurring in a relationship. So physical abuse, which is abuse of the body, such as um, hitting, kicking, punching, slapping, choking, um, emotional abuse. So that is abuse of the feelings or of the heart that could be um, but put down, shaming, blaming, um, psychological abuse, which creates fear in the mind, um, using thoughts, coercion. Um, there's often gaslighting that occurs or using others as motivators. So for example, using children, you know, as as kind of like collateral or as a threat um, and sexual abuse as well um, force or coercion and in, in engaging in any sort of sexual activity as well as um, degradation of in any sort of a sexual way cheating etc um, there are a few other types of abuse there is financial abuse which is um, using money against someone, controlling their access to finances. There's also technological abuse, which can look like um, like hacking somebody's phone, demanding to read messages, um, basically demanding access to technology. Um, and so in any and all of those constitute abuse. And again, we want to refer back and say that these are really in a relationship used at, in a pattern of behavior to maintain power and control um, over somebody in a relationship. Um, and really, the way that I, 
I think one of the best ways to define it is by allowing the per person who is surviving violence to define whether or not they are experiencing abuse since they are the expert on their own experience. Um, but I think that that's just an important piece to add when we're talking about what constitutes domestic violence. Um, and Lauren, if we could jump, oh, thank you. All right, so then what does children's exposure to domestic violence look like? So it could look like being a direct victim of violence. Um, and again, when we're saying violence, we're not just meaning physical violence. It could also be emotional. Um, it could be psychological, et cetera. Um, it could be hearing a violent event or hearing other forms of abuse. It could be involved as an eyewitness. A lot of times kids will really try to keep their parents safe. Um, or being used by a parent, for example, as a shield against another parent or a parent use, um, making threats against a child. Um, and then in the aftermath, so in that cycle of abuse as, you know, as parents might process prior conflict, as we might make amends with each other, as a plans for safety, um, children are often involved in that, even if parents don't intend for them to be. Um, so what does, what does exposure look like? So one thing we know is that younger children starting in infancy are at a higher risk for adverse effects. Um, and as more and more research comes out on trauma, so trauma is a relatively young field when we look at all the different types of psychology, right? Trauma, we've only been doing research on trauma consistently um, for a couple of decades. We're still learning more and more, but one thing we're seeing consistently is that we know that very young children in, and infants are very much affected by trauma, even when we think they're even when we think they're not, or we think they might be too little to be uh, consistently affected. Um, so another thing we want to emphasize is every child is different. Um, their gender, which very much impacts how um, they're treated in the family, the role they're given in the family, for example. Um, a boy might be expected to be the man of the house or might be expected to kind of toughen up and take things in, whereas um, a girl might be allowed to uh, to cry, you know, to outwardly process a little bit more instead of having an expectation to internalize feelings. Um, also want to, re want to recognize that I'm using a pretty a pretty narrow binary in talking about gender there. And obviously we know gender is more of a spectrum, but just for the purposes of this training, using that frame of reference. Um, also differences in family role. You know, are you the oldest? Are you the youngest? A lot of times, if there are multiple siblings, the older will take on the role of a caretaker, um, making sure siblings are safe when there's violence going on. Um, and then also trans what do the younger siblings do? Are they you know, do they know really well how to take care of themselves? Do they go to that older sibling for comfort? Um, also looking at the lethality of abuse um, carried out by the perpetrator. So if children are witnessing or experiencing more severe abuse more frequently, then we know that they will be more severely affected by it. Um, and then finally looking at children's resiliency. So we could do like a whole nother webinar on resiliency in kids, right? That's like, that's a whole super complex topic. Um, but basically just to say kids, just to say kids have different levels of resilience and some of that is innate and some of that de depends on environment and supports and like especially social supports like what other grown ups do they have in their life who are consistent who are supportive and who um, communicate positivity to them. And so those are things that can be really helpful. Um, so 50 to 70 percent of kids who witness domestic violence also um, um, witness or experience child abuse and that, so that's a pretty high number um, and I think that just tells us again that kids really are developed um, directly impacted in more way than one um, and then research also shows that kids who witness domestic abuse have greater ongoing mental health effects than kids who are experiencing abuse and again a lot of those are have that 50 to 70 percent crossover effect, right? So a lot of kiddos are experiencing both. Um, but it's, I think that is like when you take it at face value, it feels a little bit shocking to me at first um, that kids who are witnessing domestic abuse are actually more impacted than kids who are experiencing um, abuse towards themselves directly. 
Um, okay, so let's talk about ACEs. I have a feeling most of you have heard about ACEs, so just bear with me. Um, it was a study done in California from 1995 to 97. They took 17,000 adult participants in this study. Um, I'm sorry, give me one second here. My dog is chewing on a charger. No. Okay, um, apologies. The, the Zoom working from home struggle is real. Um, so, yeah, they had 17,000 participants, which is wild, as adults. Um, and what they did was ask them if they had experienced these adverse childhood events. So, and uh, this in included a few different forms of abuse, of neglect, um, exposure to domestic violence, exposure to substance abuse, family members having mental illness, parents separating or divorcing, or incarceration of a household member. Um, and they found that um, there was a really, really, really strong correlation between people who experience these adverse childhood experiences and um, negative health outcomes in later life, and particularly folks who had experienced um, four or more of these had a much, much, much higher chance of having serious health outcomes. So um, uh, mental illness, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, there is a very strong correlation there. Um, and we also know that this occurs within the context of social, um, social oppressions and power and control systems that, that exist in our society. Um, so all of that is to say that like, you know, racism, sexism, xenophobia, many different types, that those only me can, those only escalate these effects. Um, and that we really do want to take that into account. So here's a lovely visual. Um, of some of the things that can uh, that can be affected. Uh, so there can be injury for folks, such as a traumatic brain injury, fractures or burns. That's something that can that is correlated with adverse childhood experiences, mental illness, such as depression, anxiety, um, suicidal behavior, PTSD, um, maternal health, such as unintended pregnancy, complications with pregnancy, um, or health concerns for the fetus. Um, then you can, there's also infectious disease concerns, like sexually transmitted diseases, um, chronic disease, such as cancer and diabetes, um, engaging in what this diagram calls risky behaviors, but I might more categorize as um, coping behaviors, because we know people do the best they can with what they have, right? But sometimes their circumstances um, really do make it that those are the best choices they have, right? right then to deal with what, what's going on um, and then finally affect their opportunities as well. So um, affect their ability to reach um, their desired level of education, um, to have an occupation that they're satisfied with and to ha have higher income levels. Um, and Brennison had just said to, yeah, feel free to use the question and answer feature to submit any questions, like please do. I think Lauren and I would much rather answer questions than, you know, do a PowerPoint. Um, so please feel free to send those in as we go. And then we'll also make time for it at the end too. But again, would love any and all questions. Um, so what are the effects of domestic violence on kids? And we'll just talk a little bit about this here. So emotionally, um, a lot of shame, guilt, and self-blame. When you look at like the early childhood kiddos, so like toddlers into like five and six, um, they have, um, the technical term for it would be egocentrism. And what that means is like, they're still learning to differentiate between things that are directly caused by them and things that are caused by others. Like toddlers think they control and directly affect everything in the world. Um, and so what that means is that when they witness domestic violence, they often think that it's their fault or think that they're causing it. And so they can feel a lot of guilt and a lot of self-blame and a lot of confusion as to why it's, it's not stopping because they often try everything that they can to get it to stop. Um, and they often have some mixed up feelings towards parents. You know, kids can love someone and also be mad at them and also be scared at them because they're doing some things that feel really scary. Um, feelings of helplessness and powerless, again, being unable to stop violence, the fighting, they can be angry 
Um, they can feel grief of losses, and that's, I think when we hear loss, we often think of death, but it can also be loss of a relationship, loss of a parent living in the household. Um, they can also just feel grief for like loss of experiences, you know, loss of a childhood they wish they'd had. There's a lot of complex grief there. They can feel burdened, especially if they are, as I've mentioned earlier, in that caretaker role. Um, and they can also feel ambivalent. That's okay, too. Sometimes kids just really need to kind of check out in order to keep themselves, like, to prioritize their own emotional and physical well-being. Cognitively, so they might feel responsible for the violence, like I'd mentioned, especially likely in younger kids, but older kids, too, will often blame them themselves. Um, they also might blame others for their behavior. Um, that's something that people who use abusive behaviors often do, so they they will sometimes pick that up. Um, they also might learn it's okay to hurt others to get what they want because, again, that's what they've learned. That's the model they've been given. Um, they might not quite know how to express anger in a safe way, and they might need to do those things in order to feel powerful. Um, they might have a low self-concept or a concept of self-efficacy, so they can't feel like they can't change situations. They don't really have like self-determination in that. They struggle to ask for what they need or can't identify what they need. Um, they might feel anger is bad or feel really scared of anger because they, what they learned is that others get hurt when anger happens. And that might lead to that kind of like pop bottle effect. You know, you, you bottle it up and you bottle it up and you bottle it up and then it explodes and you really have no control over it. And that cycle continues. Um, and they finally might learn strict gender roles. So the dynamics of domestic violence are often really, really gendered. Um, and that is because there are huge power differentials um, between men and women, right? And again, even though we acknowledge gender is more complex than just that simple binary, um, that the system of power and control that is present in our society, very intertwined with, um, with gendered violence, um, is that people who are using abusive behaviors will use that system of power and control to exert control um, over others. So that might look like, you know, I'm the man to, to decide what to do. Um, or, you know, well, women should just, should be quiet, should mind their business. Um, and it might even come down to talking about what a marriage would look like, you know, like people work it out in a marriage. That's what they're supposed to do. Um, I do want to take a second, too, to acknowledge that uh, domestic violence occurs in all sorts of relationships and is not strictly just between um, men and women. So it happens in any sort of LGBTQ or queer relationships, and um, the numbers we have actually show that it happens at about the same rate, if not higher, than in heterosexual relationships, um, and that men also experience domestic violence as well. Um, both in relationships between two people who identify as men um, and towards men from women. Mary, we have a question. Um, oh, how, awesome. How do we explain to parents that very young, even one years old or younger um, children can be affected by living in a family where there is violence? That's a great question. Um, and I mean, Lauren, please feel free to chime in too. Um, I'm, so I'm a bit of a nerd and I kind of always turn back to the research or the data on this. Um, and I, my policy is always to be as straightforward with parents as possible. I try to partner with them. Um, and that's just because I, I believe that as a therapist, it's our role to really work, to work strongly towards giving parents as much agency as possible in the therapeutic process. Um, so I just kind of give it to them straight and say like, look, we do have research that shows us that um, kids as young as one and even younger are affected by violence. Um, and there's some specific examples that you can cite. Um, there's different there's different outcomes in mental health for kiddos. Like for example, kiddos who experience who are exposed to violence as infants, um, they'll have a harder time regulating their emotions as they get older. They'll have higher instances of mental health outcomes. Um, and if you're look at specific resources, I'll always recommend um, The Body Keeps the Score. It's a wonderful book about how trauma is um, really internalized by the body. Um, so that can be a really good resource if you have folks who are looking for 
um, for for more information on that. Um, Lauren, what, what would you add to that? Oftentimes what I'll um, talk to parents about is that kids who are that young, um, they don't have the language um, and like the agency to um, like leave that situation or talk about what's happening. Like they experience those feelings in their body. They can pick up on the energy that's happening around them, um, but they can't express it. And so a lot of times they're um, holding those experiences in their body with um, less ways to cope with them. Um, they can't talk to safe adults about what happened. Um, they can't, um, like if they're pre-crawling or pre-walking, it's harder for them to like, if they're in the same room, they wouldn't be able to leave that room. Um, and so they just have less resource. And so um, that's what we know about like why younger kids can be um, more affected than older kids. Will you be able to jump to the next slide? Thank you again, that was a great question. Um, socially. Um, so kids who have experienced domestic violence often have a pretty big social disconnect. They might be passive with peers, withdrawn, they might isolate, or they might swing to the other side of the spectrum. They might really, really engage with others, you know, join every single club, after school activity um, that is in a non-COVID world. <laughs> um, they might have poor anger management and problem solving skills, so they, you might well, you often see kids who've experienced domestic violence as, you know, the kids with a temper, the kids who are exploding, the kids who are labeled as quote unquote bad. Um, they will often have difficulty trusting others. Um, and again, that goes back to the isolation. They are really scared to form relationships because they might not have a ton of experiences of like, of really healthy relationships, you know, of good relationships where they're able to pull good things from that. Um, they also might experience relationships that start intensely and, and, and then end suddenly. So really uh, struggling with kind of like, how do you, how do you build again, a healthy relationship rather than that kind of like that fast up and quick down. <clears throat> and then a sense of connectedness. So they will often have low self-esteem, low sense of self-worth, really feel perfectionistic, always driving themselves to be better. Um, might not really trust their own perception of the world and of others, might rely on others' perceptions to guide their own. Um, oftentimes, this kind of goes hand in hand with the perfectionism, but have a lot of guilt around enjoying themselves. Um, also might have survivor's guilt, which is not only about surviving if maybe somebody else um, dies as a result of violence, but also just about, you know, why are other people being hurt and why am I not? Um, they might pretty easily separate their emotional self and their physical self. So that might look like dissociation um, or that might look like just not, not really feeling a lot of emotions. That is a coping strategy that kids will develop when there's so many complex feelings there. Um, and that goes along with two, having difficulty integrating a sense of a whole self. So again, going, they are really, really easily dissociative or go into a dissociative state because there's just so much there to feel and it's hard to feel all those things. Um, also feeling some numbness both emotionally and experientially so having a hard time just like playing and enjoying that or being joyful or, or silly you know these are the kids who might just kind of sit in a chair or like really be able to turn out the academic work but then when you're like okay time to go play they're like I don't know how to do that. Um, and then they might have spiritual or, or existential questions, which are hard for us as grownups too, you know, like how, why is this happening? Why me? Why my family? Uh, why isn't this getting better? And those, those are hard questions for anybody to sit with. All right. So we're going to jump into what child-centered play therapy is. Um, here's a lovely quote. Um, it's in playing and only in playing that the individual child or adult is able 
to be creative and to use the whole personality and it's only in being creative that the individual discovers the self. So that really sums up kind of how um, we look at play therapy. And Lauren, it looks like we have a couple more questions too. Oh, sure. Should we start with those and then we can jump into? Um, okay. So it, is it possible for young females or teens to be sexually abused by the bio father um, to punish mom for not being compliant to the abuser? Yeah, that's certainly possible. I think, um, you know, kids respond to trauma in various different ways and um, like hold feelings for both parents in different ways, depending on the child. So it sounds like in this case, um, it may be possible that this child's being sexually abused by dad, but being mad, um, pretty mad at mom for, um, not being compliant so um it would maybe feel safer for that child if mom um would do what dad says um instead of um you know trying to stand up for herself or you know do other things so um 100 percent like kids have different reactions to um, their trauma Okay, and then we have someone asking if we can explain a little more about pleasure guilt. Do you want to take that one, Mary? Sure. Yeah, so um, basically just in a really straightforward sense, feeling guilty when you experience pleasure. You know, feeling like you, may, you might not get to have good things um, or feeling feeling a sense of atonement maybe that when you have good things, there's something to make up for it later. And I think a lot of times that comes from, um, you know, having tricky or scary or bad things happen at home. You're feeling like, you know, maybe again, I'll kind of default to mom, uh, but maybe mom doesn't get to have that. Or maybe you're so intensely associated with mom and you're like, well, she's always feeling scared. She's always feeling worried. Why do I get to have these good things? And especially if the kiddo is not experiencing direct abuse too, I think that ties into some of those survivor's guilt questions as well. You know, like, why am I not experiencing this? And then why do I get to go off and have fun? Um, and two, I think sometimes kids feel very guilty when they let the worry go for a little bit. You know, like they might forget about worrying about it and taking care of everything for a little bit and they might just be a kid and then they might realize what they're doing and feel intensely guilty about that. Um, we have two more questions that I'm wondering if we want to kind of get through a little bit more and then take another question break. That sounds good. All right, so play therapy is kind of the premise of play therapy is that children organize and understand their world through play. Um, it's how kids communicate, it's how they learn, um, it's basically their language. Um, it serves a developmental purpose, so um, they're going physically, um, socially, emotionally, and intellectually through their use of play. Um, it's their way to express and manage strong and painful feelings um, that happen when they're exposed to violence. Um, and children find healing through um, their play because they know what they need, they know what they need to heal, um, they know internally like what is bothering them and so it's um, it gives them agency to play through those things that um, they're feeling like they need to process through. Um, so Child Center Play Therapy um, was originally created by Virginia Axline um, and published a book in 1947. Um, it translated into practical interventions um, and extended into filial therapy um, a little bit later. Um, and it's heavily influenced by principles of Carl Rogers, the humanistic and client-centered models. Um, so play therapy treats 
most mental health disorders and varieties of um, problems, um, not just trauma that can include depression, anxiety, um, most mental health um, symptoms that are presenting for kids. Um, it's really great for kids who need to process through trauma and different and difficult attachment attachments. Um, because in a lot of cases, kids will, um, a lot of their power and control gets taken away when they're in tra traumatic experiences. Um, and so play therapy offers a space that is really unconditional. They have the power, they have the control, they get to decide um, what they play, what they do, and how they want to navigate all of that. Um, so it can be really, really great for helpless and dis disempowered um, kids. Um, it also really helps them establish another um, learn secure attachment. Like Mary had mentioned earlier, um, that resilience in kids really, um, we know it really depends on the number of safe and secure relationships that kids have. And so it's another opportunity to build um, another secure relationship with a caring adult. <clears throat> um, different ways that we determine when a client is coming to closure um, of play therapy um, is their progression through different stages. So there's four different main stages of um, non-directive play therapy. And mm -hmm. so we pay attention to kind of what stage they're in. Um, when they get to that mastery stage, it's really kind of an indication that they process through um, that cycle of therapy. Not to say a kid's um, kids will often go through different um, cycles of play, play therapy. And so um, even though they have come to this mastery level and stage, they may begin again and um, go through, through some resolution of other things that um, might be impacting them. So we really watch for um, shifts in play themes and also pay attention and connect with caregivers and teachers and other um, adults in their life to talk about and um, process through different symptoms and how they're functioning in those other environments. Um, that can also determine whether or not we decide to um, close or continue going with therapy. <clears throat> Um, so there's eight basic principles of non-directive play therapy. First um, is that warm relationship with the therapist, developing good rapport as soon as possible, <clears throat> um, and the therapist accepting the child exactly how they are. So that unconditional positive regard, um, they get to show up in whatever way that they want to, and the therapist is still going to like them and still going to be there for them. The third principle is establishing a feeling, uh, feelings of permissiveness in the relationship. So um, again, they get to show up, they get to do, um, they can make mistakes, they can get mad, they can play big, um, and all of that's okay. Um, even if they, there's not very many rules in play therapy, but even when they like cross a boundary, um, it's okay. Like um, the clinician will still like them. Um, the fourth one is the therapist is alert and recognizes the feelings of the child um, that they're expressing and reflects those feelings back to them. Um, this really helps them gain insight um, into their own behaviors and their feelings and often like just gives language for what they're experiencing when they don't, um, they might not know. All right, so we're gonna do another poll. And the poll question is, what might a reflection of the child's feelings sound like?
All right, we'll take a few more seconds. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And here are the results. So yeah, um, all of these are actually really great reflections that you could use with the child. Um, all of them encompass um, identifying feelings for kids um, and really connecting um, what maybe they were thinking um, and like how that played out. Um, how those emotions played out for them. So it's really helping them connect when you're feeling mad, this is something that you're doing. Or when you're feeling sad, um, this might mean this. And even like um, non-directed play therapy is really forgiving and it's great because um, kids will often correct you um, if you reflect wrong. So in that situation where you're feeling sad and you're under the blanket, you might be thinking about mom. If that's not what the child is thinking about, oftentimes they'll tell you, no, that's not what I was feeling, or that's not what I was thinking about. Um, and so they'll give you a lot of, um, they have the power to like redirect you and really tell you, um, which is great. And one thing I'll add to Lauren is that I think there's not a small amount of kids who will, I guess, correct you incorrectly like like we talked about before it can be really scary to be in touch with especially some of those bigger feelings you know so you might have a kiddo who's like sobbing and you say oh you're feeling really sad I wonder if it was hard that I asked about mom you know they'll say like no I'm happy and you know get up and start playing with something and tears still streaming down their face um in that in that moment again you just you want to be with them and acknowledge it's acknowledge what their intention is you know which is like okay I hear you you're feeling happy mm -hmm. the intention is that you you leave the space there for them to be to have to feel however they want to feel basically and then in time they'll be able to acknowledge it and say like oh I am really sad but just building that trust and the establishing that the play therapy room is a space where they can feel however they want to feel and there's no negative consequence mm -hmm. yep exactly All right, um, principle five is the therapist maintains a deep respect for the child's ability to solve their own problems um, and the responsibility to make choices and institute change is the child's. So oftentimes I think as adults, we really, um, we wanna solve problems for kids and we wanna help them when they're feeling frustrated um, and really play therapy um, kind of challenges us not to do that. Um, we, as play therapists, we will help the child with a problem if they ask, um, the, it's kind of a rule of three. So if they ask for help, you'll often reflect, oh, you're really wanting to help right now. Are you really wanting help with that thing right now? Um, and if they ask three times, then you would go ahead and help them with that. But it really empowers them to, um, try different things and solve the problem for themselves. Um, a lot of times um, I've experienced kids more often than not, actually, I think, where they'll ask for help but continue to try by themselves. Um, and they really want to do it, but I think oftentimes kids are so conditioned to um, just really hand it over to grown-ups and have grown-ups do that for them. <clears throat> um, the sixth principle is therapists don't attempt to direct the child's actions or the conversation in any way. Um, the child leads and the therapist follows. So this includes like asking questions. We um, really don't ask any, very few questions in non-directive play therapy. Um, sometimes if we're really curious about something and we wanna, um, we wanna know something, we might say, oh, I wonder, um, just kind of thinking out loud. And then sometimes the child will answer, give you an answer and sometimes they'll just keep playing. Um, but most of the time, we just don't ans ask any questions. Um, they get to decide and direct how things go and what we talk about and what we do. 
Um, we don't hurry the therapy along. It's really gradual and um, and up to the child, like how long they can take, however long they need. <clears throat> and there's, like I mentioned before, there's very few limits um, that are placed um, on the child in the room. Basically, um, the major limits that are set is that we keep each other safe and oftentimes uh, the toys too, but that really like, it's dependent on the therapist's preference. Um, sometimes therapists are really okay with some of the toys in the room getting broken um, and sometimes not so much. So um, that's really kind of a preference thing, but the biggest thing is safety. <clears throat> so our goals for kids in play therapy, so that they're better able to understand and articulate, um, regulate emotions, um, and be able to eventually express difficult emotions in healthy ways. Um, we really work to strengthen self-esteem, help them form identity, um, increase their self-efficacy, and understand that, they, um, that they're important. Um, also to process through traumatic experiences and integrate them, um, kind of develop some mastery over them, integrate them um, into themselves instead of like, um, this thing really defines me, like, yep, this thing happened to me. And like, these are all the other things about me that are great. Um, and I have all these resources to deal with them, um, them now when those like memories and things come up. Um, they're also able to identify their needs, express them, and rely on caregivers to meet them. A lot of times, um, kids who have experienced trauma um, really uh, have a hard time relying on adults to meet their needs. They really um, kind of develop this need to do them, this need to do it themselves. Um, and so this kind of reestablishes their ability to ask for help when they need it. Um, and then they're also able to assert boundaries for themselves in relationships with others, um, especially caregivers after they've experienced violence. So this is kind of an example of toys that might be in the playroom. Um, this is definitely not an exclusive list, but um, we look at different toys kind of representing different themes in play therapy. So themes around nurturance um, might include toys like babies and puppets, um, kitchen, so like um, feeding or being fed, um, dollhouse play. Um, communication toys are like megaphones, phones, walkie talkies, things like that. Um, aggression toys, we often see like Nerf gun play, soldiers, dinosaurs, lots of like dinosaur fighting or um, superhero fighting or toy weapons, things like that. Uh, mastery toys are often water toys, um, like basketball games, card games, board games, things that, um, things that like have a little bit more rules or like there's more accomplishment um, to them. Um, and then creative expression toys. So dress up clothes, um, arts and crafts materials, Play-Dohs, um, money, emergency medical kits, animal or toy animals, uh, things like that. So this is an example of what a playroom might look like. So you'll see uh, back in the corner, there's kind of those kitchen toys. You have the dollhouse. Um, there's that white bag is um, oftentimes referred to as like a bop bag. Um, kids can kind of punch that if they're feeling upset. Um, let's see. Here's another example. Again, the dollhouse, the creative, um, creative expression with the easel. There's a whole ton of, um, like a whole rack of dress up toys in the background there. Um, in the back left, you can see kind of like a little puppet, uh, puppet window. And again, there's another example. Um, 
oftentimes it's really great. You can kind of see in this bottom right corner that there's a sand tray. And sand trays are really important for kids and oftentimes um, kids will gravitate towards sand tray um, play. It can be really like the sand is super fine and calming. Um, and so it's often like a regulating space to play out different experiences that they might have. So in all of our play therapy offices, we have sand trays and right next to them are um, large shelves full of like different figurines. And so kids will like take those figurines, play out different experiences or different play themes um, using the sand tray. So some logistics about play therapy, they're typically, uh, typically last 30 to 45 minutes uh, weekly sessions. Um, we really like to see kids for 10 sessions or more, but it really depends on what the child needs. At um, our agency, the average length of play therapy treatment is seven to five months, but oftentimes um, we see kids for longer than that. Um, and kind of the traditional start to all of our play therapy sessions starts with um, the therapist and the child walking into the room and the therapist will say something like, so the, here's your play therapy room, you can do or say almost anything you want in here. Um, and that's kind of the transition into the room. Um, like I had mentioned, rules and limits are really only established as they're needed for safety. Um, it's really important that the child gets a five minute warning when um, time is about to be up and then again a one minute warning. Um, and kids are never really, never expected to clean up after sessions. If they choose to, that's fine, but this isn't um, something that we would expect from them at all. Oftentimes what, um, the reason why we, we don't expect them to clean up is kids will make a big, oftentimes make a big mess or really um, play a lot of different things that um, represent their trauma. They're like they're sharing their experiences with us, their hard experiences with us. And so um, when they do that, it's a good representation of like, they get to leave that experience and those big feelings and those hard things with us and we'll hold that for them until the next time that they come. Um, therapists really want to stay close to the client, be attuned uh, at the client's level, but um, oftentimes don't use touch. Um, and again, that is um, a big preference for each clinician. Um, and so I think we're gonna pause here and have people um, post in the chat why, why you might think a clinician would not use touch in um, a play therapy session. There's right or wrong answers. Just curious to think what your points of view might be. Yeah, so somebody said it develops an attachment to the clinician. Um, it might be a trigger for other experiences. That's actually a really big one. Um, you're kind of going fast. Do you want to chime in, Mary, help me read these? Yeah, yep, a lot of really good um, points about triggers. Um, sometimes touch can be distracting and um, less professional. Yeah, wanting to give kids bodily autonomy, that's a huge one. That's a great one. Um, could guide the child to play in a certain way. Yeah, we don't want to influence them or make them think what one thing or the other is better. Yeah, those are all really, really wonderful answers. And I think like as a general rule, um, for myself, like I said, every clinician is different. Um, I won't generally use touch until I really know that child and we've developed a relationship and I know 
more about what their triggers are, more about what they're comfortable with, more about what their parents are comfortable with or caregivers. Um, and we did have a question on what if the child initiates touch? Um, Lauren, what's, what's your view on that? Um, as long as it's appropriate touch, um, I totally um, accept that and um, just roll with it as far as like whatever we're playing with, whatever we're doing. And I, I know I'm saying we have a bunch of um, a bunch of questions here. I think we're pretty close to our next kind of section transfer, and then maybe we can just focus on the questions then. Sounds great. Um, so as far as limit setting, again, um, again, not a, not many limits um, and really clinician dependent. Um, it's important, it is really important that if something is unsafe um, or um, large destruction is imminent, um, that we really put a limit on that. It really, it provides safety for the, the child and security and really helps contain some of their feelings. I think um, it can be really grounding and really helpful for kids to be provided with those limits around safety. Um, I think kids really seek those limits and will push them, um, but it's really containing for them when grownups can, can say, no, that's not safe and that's not something we're gonna do. Um, so some common rules are um, like not throwing things at the therapist, the sand stays in the sand tray. Um, You know, keeping our bodies safe, so like no self harm in the in the therapy room. You would keep, um, you would set a limit for that and keep them from hurting themselves or hurting you. And one thing too that I always think about when you're thinking about um, limit setting is like the kid might not have had a ton of experience with a grown up saying like, no, we're not going to do that, but I still like you and I'm still going to be here with you and I'm going to figure out what we can do instead. Like that can be huge for some kiddos. Yeah. Um, empathic listening is a huge part of um, the process. So reflecting what the client does, um, the therapist really works hard to see um, see the world through the eyes of the child and how the child is experiencing their world. Um, tracking and narrating their behavior and their feelings um, with affect and emotion. So you want to match kind of how, um, how your client is showing up in the room. So, um, you typically wouldn't, if the child is presenting like fairly flat with not much emotion, you typically wouldn't like go, um, above and beyond and be really, um, theatrical or, um, loud or, you know, use, use a lot of, um, emotion in what you say, you'd really kind of want to match um, how your client presents. Um, it, you often sound like a sportscaster um, when you are narrating. Um, again, we wouldn't, and we'll watch a bit of an example um, in a few slides here of what is um, a short clip of what a session kind of looks like. Um, so again, like not asking any questions, um, do it, no like encouraging statement or suggestions. I think oftentimes um, for me, it's really hard. Like I'll check myself a lot of times because I'll wanna like give encouraging statements or praise kids for, for doing something. And it's really not about that. Um, again, not helping a child unless um, they ask you. Um, and no um, criticism or judgment. Um, for imaginary, imagine, imaginary play, um, sometimes clients will play pretty solitary. Sometimes they'll bring the therapist into the play with them. Um, the client can often or might often ask a therapist to like play or act a role and then you would kind of um, come out of that narrative um, narrative role and 
um, play the way the child is directing you to. Um, so the therapist will seek direction from the client. Sometimes um, if I'm really unsure what the client wants me to do, um, I'll kind of, uh, I'll do a whisper and come out of my, my play role and be like, oh, I wonder what's gonna happen or what this person should do next. Um, and then the child gets to kind of direct me um, in that way. Um, all right, so we're gonna watch just part of this clip um, and you'll have this slide. So if you wanna go back and watch more of it, um, feel free to do so. It's just a really good um, example of what play therapy can look like. I wonder if there's gonna be weirdness with like screen sharing. Yeah. Um, can you hear it? No. You couldn't hear that? Okay. Um, give me one second. I have an idea. Yeah, and I'll try and answer a question quick while you're working on that, Lauren. Um, mm -hmm. So what... We have a question. When two children from the same family are aggressive to each other most of the time, do you practice they're included in the same play therapy or it's better to do therapy separately? Um, so play therapy, we... Oh, awesome. Um, so play therapy is just about always individual. Um, and the reason for that is we just really, we recommend um, that kids have their own space, that it's a space for them to focus on themselves, you know, and their feelings. And oftentimes, if there are other kiddos or other family members in the room, then they're not as able to freely express themselves and instead are worrying about others' feelings or reactions. Um, so I think if there continue to be concerns, you could always consider maybe some co-occurring family therapy or parent support as well. Um, but yeah, pretty much always would recommend that kids are seen individually. Um, Mary, can you see the video at this point? Or are you seeing the slides? I can see Minnesota cats safely, awesome. securely. All right, so here we go. Securely, accurately. Oh, well, that's ironic. that I hold on to the toys that he gives me through the entirety of the session and I do this because I operate under the assumption that if he gives me something he's attempting to connect with me so I want to non-verbally communicate to him that I'm open to that connection and I'll stay open to that connection through the entirety of our session. Oh, no. Okay. I'll go 
segment of the session you'll notice that the young boy is struggling with a particular task and in my efforts to help facilitate his frustration tolerance and his ability to make self-directed decisions I attempt to facilitate esteem and encouragement facilitate decision making and self-responsibility reflect feelings and I track supposed to be like those and something's wrong with it. of things did folks notice about her intervention? Um, and Lauren, we have a question. What is tracking? Checking is um, just kind of how she's following what and like narrating what he was doing. Um, so it's really just kind of being that narrator for what's happening in the playroom. Yeah, she always yeah. mirrored his emotions, um, very hands-off physically, yep, lots of reflection. Um, to, yeah, it must be difficult to prevent, not provide encouragement and praise. That is really difficult. Um, one other thing that I'll point out is that she didn't assign 
names or labels to any of the objects that um, he was playing with unless he said it first, which is an important part of um, play therapy because kids will use their imaginations. Like they might take a cup and it might represent a boat. Um, and so it's really um, important not to like assign meaning to something that the child has an assigned meaning to. And so she'll say like really generic things like, oh, you put that there and you're doing that. It's a very different language to practice. And we have a question. Does this technique work well for speech delayed children? Um, we're actually going to chat about kids with disabilities in a bit. So stay tuned. All right. So let's see. Maybe, I don't know if we'll have time for the activity, Mary. Do you think we should? Don't think we will, which yeah. kind of breaks my heart because it's so much fun. Um, I'll just kind of briefly describe what this activity is. So um, oftentimes with kids, when we first start with them, we might do a couple assessment activities. And this is really the most directive that we would get um, at our agency as far as play therapy goes. Um, and we'll do this more with like um, psychotherapy groups that we have with kids. Um, but this is this feeling hard activity is where um, we have the child assign a color to each of these feelings um, and they can add a feeling or two if they want to. Um, and then we have a piece of paper that has a heart on it and then we direct them to color their heart with how they're feeling each one of those feelings and they can be as creative as they want to. Um, and do it however they want to. Sometimes kids get super creative and uh, it's really fun to see and we'll really just kind of reflect what we're noticing um, in the heart. And so maybe um, it's a very kind of like psychoanalytic um, type of assessment where maybe they colored, um, you notice that yellow represents happy and yellow is um, a color that they use to like outline their heart. Um, but there's a lot of maybe like sad and angry colors um, in the inside of their heart. So we might reflect like, oh, you're really happy on the outside, but on the inside you're feeling so sad and angry. Um, and just kind of um, analyze their heart with them and like think about what that might mean. <clears throat> and that's typically for like older kids, um, a little older kids. All right, and then some play things um, that are pretty common to pop up are um, power and control, aggression, um, different emotions, good versus evil or good and bad, um, winning, losing, identity, grief and loss, um, mastery of different skills or tasks, nurturance, regression, um, trauma reenactment and mastery, attachment, boundaries, um, danger, threat, safety, rescue, protection. Um, that's a pretty common one. Resilience, persistence, problem solving, um, desires and wishes, and cultural symbols and rituals. All right. So we'll take one more poll. Um, is play therapy appropriate for kids with disabilities? All right, a couple more seconds and then I'll close the poll. All 
All right, I'm gonna close the poll. And here are the results. Yeah, so for all kids, regardless of disability, um, and that is something that we also agree with. I know there's different, people have different viewpoints and um, kind of different specialties as far as population of kids that they choose to work with. But um, really um, at DAP, we really believe that regardless of disability, play therapy is um, an appropriate intervention for kids with autism or other disabilities. Yeah, so specifically going back to that question um, a little bit ago about to kids with speech delays, um, yeah, absolutely. I think even more sometimes that this might be an alternate way to express themselves, like something we often say is that play is children's language. So this might give them a language to express themselves where they're not able to express themselves at the level they might wish to um, verbally. Um, and how old is too old for play therapy? Um, it really depends on the child's developmental age. Um, oftentimes we say um, around the age of three when kids really start playing. Um, I think sometimes folks go as young as two. Um, we do early childhood therapy at DAP, but other, like, other play therapists might see kids younger. Um, and so at our agency, we like six to around the age of 12. Um, sometimes if they're developmentally older than 12, we might not, um, we might do something a little bit different. It really just kind of depends on um, the child and what they're feeling like they want and um, what their parents or caregivers feel like is best for them too. All right, so finally, we'll just kind of speed on through talking about supporting parents and caregivers, and then we'll get to questions at the end. Um, so this is more from a um, perspective of advocacy um, or thinking about folks who would be making recommendations to a parent or a caregiver about play therapy for a kiddo. Um, so be really clear with parents about what it is and how it's useful. Um, sharing resources to explain what is play therapy. And we do have some resources at the end of the PowerPoint here. Um, providing uh, client-centered treatment. So really give them all the information that you have about what play therapy is, how it works. Um, involve them as much as possible as a partner in treatment um, and involving the client too as much as they're developmentally able. So that might look different for a three-year-old, you know, rather than an 11-year-old. For example, like the 11 year old would be able to talk a lot more about like what they want to get out of therapy and how they want to participate. Um, and providing psychoeducation too. Um, so tell them about the need for consistency, which means like, you, get, you know, coming consistently to sessions, um, having it go. Lauren had mentioned earlier that we really like to see folks for at least 10 sessions. Um, talking about the length of treatment. If we had more time, we talk about what might influence the length of treatment, um, but I mean, things that influence it will include child's progress, you know, if they're reaching the goals that they have for themselves and that parents have for them, um, which and goals should conversation throughout the length of treatment. Um, you know, sometimes too, like there's outside circumstances, sometimes families move, um, sometimes financial or transportation barriers come up, so that unfortunately influences it too. Um, and no matter what causes the end of treatment, it's really important to have an intentional ending or a goodbye. So providing that information up, you know, that it's like, even if it's like, well, we can't move to the office anymore. Can we do a phone call? Can we do Zoom now? Now more than ever, you know, we have that capability. Um, and then also doing some really intentional support and safety planning for um, the kiddo and caregivers surrounding the end of play B. That can be a hard time. Um, it can be more emotional. This regulation can come up. So really thinking about how can we make sure you're safe and you have all the resources that you need as we end therapy. Okay, um, and then thinking about 
how do we interact with caregivers during play therapies? Um, so as play therapists, we'll conduct regular check-ins with caregivers. Um, we'll talk about um, symptoms and behaviors that they're seeing across different settings. It's important to have that information. Um, and these check-ins can be with or without the client, depending on their developmental age and the content of sessions. Um, so we generally want the kiddos to be involved as much as they can be, again, client-centered. Um, but that depends on their developmental age. You know, think of the three-year-old versus the 11-year-old I had just referenced. Um, also content of sessions. You might have a parent who really wants to process like, you know, an early trauma that the child experienced that's coming up in session, but that they really don't feel comfortable talking about with the child yet. Um, and then the therapist wants to be transparent with kids about um, when the therapist is going to check in with caregivers and what they are going to say and then allowing them to ask questions. So just saying like, hey, just so you know, your mom and I are going to have a phone call next week um, and she's probably going to tell me like what's been going on at school. So I can, I can know that about you and we can talk about that if you want to. And then following up afterwards and say, hey, we did talk about X, Y, and Z. Do you have any questions for me? Um, and this feeds into trust and confidentiality too. So keeping the content of sessions confidential as much as possible. And you want clients to know this, you want caregivers to know this, um, and exceptions to confidentiality. So like mandated reporting, right? You know, like if you tell me about that you are being hurt or somebody else is being hurt, I might have to tell all other people that because my job is to keep everybody safe. Um, you also want to tell the client that you're going to keep most of the content of their sessions confidential, though, other than those mandated reporting exceptions. Um, if a parent really is pressing us, we might say something like, oh, they're making a really good use of their time. They're really engaging. But we're not going to say, oh, they're playing with dinosaurs, and then we played fire engines, you know, and then they played out some trauma stuff in the sand, but in the sand tray. That's, that's the client's information to hold and to share. Um, and before we would report anything, whether it's a systems report or a caregiver report, we would let the child, the client know as well, and we would talk about it with them. And we had another poll here, but I think we're going to have to jump over it, unfortunately. Just got so much to talk about. Um, so how do we talk about play therapy with caregivers. And I think this goes back to the question too of like, how do we make the recommendation? So some things you might get straight away from caregivers is like, it's just play, how does that help? Or maybe talking about their problems um, and just really helping them understand that play is a huge language for children. Um, putting, like we mentioned earlier, putting kids in charge of sessions, lets them, lets them have control and mastery. It lets them express the trauma, how they feel comfortable which is again, giving them mastery over the trauma, which is kind of a flip-flop from how it originally occurred. Um, and then they also have that really powerful experience of having a time just for them, of getting to decide exactly what they are doing, of having that powerful relationship with a therapist um, and letting them know that this has been used for over 25 years with really um, successfully tracked results. And that's consistent over time. Um, another thing that I'll kind of prepare caregivers for, and this will answer um, someone's question about the answer to the poll. Um, so kids do, um, oftentimes we do expect that kids might go through an a regressive stage um, while they're in play therapy. And so um, there might be a period of time which really depends on the age and, um, and the, just all of the things that are surrounding the child's development. Um, and their trauma. So um, the length of that regressive stage might very much vary um, as far as length and intensity and all of those things. And so um, I usually want to prepare caregivers for that um, for if and when it comes up. Um, and maybe it just happens in the play therapy space, but it also might um, kind of boil over into other environments too as they're processing through their experiences. Um, and then finally, so we've mentioned that um, play is a language in kids and you will see kids playing out their trauma outside of play therapy sessions, obviously, you know, so thinking about what does traumatic play look like and it, it really depends um, reenacting past events with toys or just with their own actions or dialogue. Um, we, and then they can kind of like repetitively act it out sometimes like 
be really repetitive about an action, repetitive about a whole scene. It depends. Um, there's also themes that, so like aggression is a really common theme, especially in kiddos who have seen like physical violence happening. Um, to an outsider, it can look really disorganized, this type of play, and you might not recognize it as like reenacting trauma, traumatic events at first. Um, but we think of the kiddos as creating meaning from chaos, that they need to create this like chaoticness or, you know, maybe not have it be as neatly organized at first, because what they need to do is create that big mess and then figure out how to rein it in as they go. Um, and again, can include developmental regression surrounding the play or during the play. So they might, it might be like a seven-year-old and they're playing like a three-year-old might play, you know, or they might stop using as sophisticated of language. Um, and this is also true if they're processing a trauma that happened earlier in their lives. A lot of the time we'll see that kids will use like the abilities that they had at the time of the trauma. So like if a trauma happened really young, before they learn to talk, it might be hard for them to talk about it. They might just do like straight out play or they might use more like grunts or points. Uh, and all of that is completely normal, but it can be really scary for outside people to see. Um, so we want to allow kiddos to engage in their play fully. You know, even though again, it can look scary the kids really do know what's best for them. Um, we wanna provide support for them and acceptance of play, <clears throat> even if the themes of play are hard for us to see. Um, and we also wanna recognize that there's often vicarious trauma caused. So vicarious trauma, um, kind of like collateral trauma, um, secondary trauma, or it can trigger others' trauma, especially if their trauma is similar. You know, maybe kiddo witnessed an incident of domestic abuse and then mom experienced that. And so mom is really triggered when kiddo starts engaging in um, reenactment of that incident. Um, so creating a self-care plan, what, how do I take care of myself? You know, do I need to step out of the room? Um, and then understanding that it might be too much for the kiddo, especially as they start um, engaging in that trauma play. They might need to just stop and do something else. They might get really worked up. They might need more support. And so being there for them, helping them to regulate, understanding that they might not be totally in control um, and really partnering with them to develop their own self-efficacy, that sense of control um, and that sense of mastery. Um, and then understand the collateral impacts of trauma play. Again, as I've mentioned before, others are often impacted um, by the trauma triggers inherent in kids' play. Um, providing, providing a space to fully engage in that trauma play, which, um, which is play therapy. Um, so it really, if you're seeing kids consistently engaging in reenactment, um, that might be a really good sign that they could really benefit from a uh, from some play therapy time. Um, and then if you do need to redirect, like if the triggers are getting to be too much for someone, or even if you just like need to go somewhere, um, letting them know that their play is okay, just that there's other stuff. So the example I have is like, it feels really good for you to play about the police coming, but it's making Bobby feel really, really scared. Um, let's go play with the dinosaurs. And then later you and I can do more playing and talking about the police. So letting them know it's okay, but that just other, others are being affected. Okay, um, so we wanted to talk a little bit about the services that DAP offers. Um, I'll be really quick and then you all can certainly go back and reference this presentation. Um, we do offer play therapy services. Um, as Lauren mentioned earlier, average length of treatment is about seven seven and a half months, but it really differs. Um, and we offer talk therapy for older kids too, up to age 18 and sometimes older. Um, and then I just kind of keep moving through the slides. Yeah, we offer early childhood services and I will throw out a shout out that right now our early childhood services don't have a wait list. Um, so for kids zero to six and a parent who have experienced domestic violence, um, working on strengthening that relationship and then using it to process trauma together. And we also offer groups, two groups per year, spring and fall for nine to 12 year olds over Zoom. We are now enrolling for our spring 2021 group. So feel free to reach out to either of us. Um, if you have questions about that, we have openings right now. Um, and then we have an ongoing parent caregiver group as well on Tuesday nights from seven to nine. 
um, that's really open and flexible. So feel free to reach out if you or somebody you know could be interested in that as well. Um, and then DAP has some other services as well. We have case management and they have, um, they are, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. So case management, um, they do service connection and research building for resource building for DAP clients. They also um, support people in entering into the coordinated entry system for people who are at risk of homelessness or homeless. Um, our, our advocacy team does legal advocacy, so they help folks with safety planning, orders for protection, harassment restraining orders, and they have a chat line. So from nine to noon, um, every weekday, you can chat with a legal advocate. They can answer your questions, provide resources and support. Um, and I do want to recognize too, it is 2.30. If you need to hop off, please hop off um, and we'll try and answer the questions here in a second. Um, we also have services for victim survivors of, of abuse. We have a group therapy service um, and we have immediate openings for military connected survivors of abuse. And then we also have our intervention and prevention services, which is for folks who have used abusive behaviors. Um, we offer um, a group service for them, some individual services, usually after they've completed group. Um, and then we have our change step group, which is specifically for people with military connections, and that is also taking folks immediately. And then finally, I want to end with a quote from oh, Judith Herman, which you can, yeah, you can read later. We've got some resources there. We've got and then after resources, we have, oh, or before, we have referrals. So these are um, places who are currently providing trauma-informed play therapy services. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, and this is also in the, um, <clears throat> in the, the uh, Twin Cities area. So for those of you from out of state, obviously, it's going to be less useful for you. Um, and at the bottom, you can search for a play therapist through the Association for Play Therapy. And for clinicians, if you're interested in play therapy training, that's a great place for you to start looking at resources. And then our resources. Okay, so um, questions. Um, one question was if we have intervention prevention programs for um, females and we do, we have our um, victim survivor services we offer group and occasionally individual therapy. Um, intervention prevention though. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes, oh, yeah. we, do. <laughs> um, we do have inter intervention prevention services as well for folks who use abusive behaviors um, and those are weekly groups. Um, you can contact DAP if you're interested in those. And then we also have had a question um, overshad overshadowing ASD, ADHD, and PTSD symptoms. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. And I, it's really great that you're asking that because I don't think enough discussion goes on about what trauma and autism look like. Um, I often think a lot that symptoms of ADHD um, can actually just be really well disguised symptoms of trauma, symptoms of PTSD. You get that hypervigilance, that distractibility, that moving really quickly. Um, but regardless, anyways, of diagnostic pictures, um, that kiddo still sounds super appropriate for play therapy for me, you know, regardless of what those symptoms are. And even, even, even more, I guess, in regards to that, you know, I, I would guess that they've probably experienced some roadblocks because of those diagnoses, because of those symptoms. Um, so I would say that play therapy would absolutely be appropriate. Um, I personally have some history working with um, kids with autism, so I'm happy to connect further about if you have further questions. Um, one of the questions was how effective has play therapy been through Zoom if um, the child is under the age of three? Um, and actually, we, our early childhood services um, that we do over Zoom actually have, um, we don't do non-directive play therapy for kids under the age of three. We do parent-child work. Um, and they have shifted a bit um, where we find that we're doing a little more work um, with 
parents um, on that end, like more check-in calls. Um, Mary, you have more of the EC caseload if you want to talk about how that looks a little bit different. Yeah, it is, it is interesting. Um, we just, we do our best and it is a lot more communication um, between parents and uh, between the parent and the clinician. Um, and, you know, in some ways it's harder and in some ways I think it really opens up new doors. Um, it, it can be a little tricky sometimes because I think younger kids have trouble like conceptualizing that there's a person behind the screen. I think sometimes they just think that like I'm a nice picture on a computer. And I think if and when we ever meet, they're going to be really weirded out by the fact that I am actually a human. Um, but uh, we just we do the best we can and kids have fun with it. Like kids will carry us around the house. You know, there's Unfortunately, there's a good amount of like picking up the computer and spinning, which makes you really dizzy. Um, I have had some fun with some kids like doing a share screen over Zoom and playing ga like games on pbskids.com. So there's there's a lot of great opportunities there when you're creative. Um, let's see. Maybe we'll answer like two more questions. Do you have ones that are standing out, Mary? Um. Let's see if there's any themes here. Um, so we, we have a question about if all playrooms are the same, we would ever adjust a playroom depending on the child. Um, so all playrooms generate the same contents, like playrooms at DAP are, are pretty similar. We have most of the same things in all of them. Um, I think, well, I mean, speaking for myself, I will definitely make sure we have toys related to things that I know a child has experienced. So for example, if they've seen a family member be it, I might make sure we have like a police costume, or, you know, or maybe like a, a jail toy um, because we do want them to be able to play that out. Although, you know, sometimes a kiddo will, I don't know, make a jail in the sand tray, you know, and use little fish as the police officers. Like they don't need to have that, but it's often helpful. Um, and yeah, as well, I, th I think that sometimes if there's safety risks you can remove objects if you know that um, the child is super unsafe or like that it might be a trigger for them or that just it would be hard for them to use it lauren would you add to that um I, you know play therapy is like super adaptable and so you can do play therapy with very little therapy toys, but you can also do it with a room full of toys. Um, I know clinicians who do play therapy, um, kind of like a, more of like a home visiting context or um, they go to in like different, like maybe they'll go to a school or another environment that the child's in and they'll just have like a suitcase um, with various toys. And so, um, yeah, I think right, you're right on with like um, having toys in there that that could be really representative to the child's experience, but kids are creative and adaptable and um, they often work with what they have. Okay, is there one more question that's standing out to you, Lauren? Um, someone had asked about um, like how to help kids in school who are showing social effects of domestic violence while at school or um, I think there was another school question that I had read earlier. Yeah. How teachers can support students who are acting out due to trauma or abuse. Mm -hmm. um, I think you can use a lot of the reflecting and like narrating um, skills that we talked about today, like really reflecting on what kids are feeling, what they're experiencing, um, offering them breaks and support in different ways. 
um, checking in with your school social worker if you have one um, to help get some resources or connect those kids to um, to play therapy or to other services that could be really helpful. Um, but I think it's really important to kind of slow down with that child, offer them some grace, um, really help them identify what's going on. Um, and like Mary talked about, like having them help with kind of um, giving them agency in the plan, like um, what they can do to help themselves if they're feeling triggered or um, how they want you to help them. And one more thing I might add to that too is kind of going back to the beginning, um, thinking about like how we talked about the emotional impacts of domestic violence, you know, understanding that the child is using the tools that they've been given, the things that they've learned in their environment, you know, and that there's, there's, there's you know, never any such thing as a bad kid, that they are really doing the, their best and they're trying really hard. And when they're struggling, that means like they need more love, more nurturance. Um, and that you being a consistent support person who believes in them, who's communicating hope to them, um, can make all the difference for them. Um, that that's a huge predictor of resiliency and um, will just do innumerable good things for them. Um, so just really trying to like take a deep breath and center yourself, you know, have patience with them and understand that what they need more than anything is a grown up looking out for them and pointing out all the good things that they need. Um, so thank you all for being here today. It was really great to, to have so many enthusiastic participants. And I'm sorry we couldn't answer more of your questions. They were really, really great ones. Mm -hmm. I would love to like take another hour and talk through them. Um, Brennison just posted a feedback link in the chat. If you have a moment, please, we would really, really appreciate your feedback, um, any and everything you have to offer. Um, but. Otherwise, just want to say thank you again very much and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah, thanks everybody.